What up, my crush? It's me, Fresh! Last time, if you remember, I ended up speaking about my top 10 Pokémon from Generation 1, sharing my thoughts on my Pokémon team and everyone else in between. However, with Gen 1 done and dusted, it's time to dive in to Generation 2 with the Johto region. This generation offered us quite a lot compared to the first game, and it even allowed you to visit the first game locations. So considering this new generation of Pokémon, it's no surprise that I have favorites from this generation too. So, without further ado, let's just dive straight on in. Here is my top 10 Pokémon of Generation 2. Number 10. Noctowl. Noctowl is one of those Pokémon that's just so simple and yet it's so perfect. I love owls. So naturally, I love Noctowl as well. Its name comes from Nocturnal and Owl. Pretty obvious there. Noctowl is most likely based off the Eurasian Eagle Owl, most likely because of its similar appearance and big eyes. Noctowl is one of those Pokemon I was first introduced to through the anime. In particular, through Ash's Noctowl. Ash's Noctowl stands out for a number of reasons. Not only is it smaller than many other Noctowl, but it's also the first and only shiny Pokémon Ash has caught up till this point. I grew so accustomed to this design so much that it feels weird saying that this big brown Noctowl is the original, because I'm so familiar with Ash's Noctowl and how it looks. Plus, it doesn't help that I even caught one of these shiny Noctowl for myself. What luck, right? Its eyes are specialized to see in the dark, it rotates its head 180 degrees to think. It flips its head completely upside down when it's extremely puzzled. Ouch, that must hurt. It can fly without making any noise. And as a result, it's called the Emperor of the Night. Wow. You can make a book series and film about that. The only downside I have for Noctowl is that it's a basic normal and flying type. You just get them at the start of every game, and because of its basic typing, there's not really much you can do with it. There's plenty of other dual flying types you can use in this generation. Many of them are way better than Noctowl. So, despite your look, Noctowl, unfortunately you're going to be at my number 10 spot. Number 9. Octillery. Octillery is another one of those Pokemon that I just find delightfully goofy. Its name comes from Octopus and Artillery. Why, do you ask? Well, originally, Octillery had armor and a helmet to resemble a tank. But for whatever reason, Octillery's never depicted with this armor again. Eh, oh well. Maybe we'll find a regional variant that uses this armor in some way. Maybe make it a steel type. I love Octillery's design. It kind of reminds me of the Animal Crossing octopi. Oh, and you'll never guess what. This is what Octillery evolves from. Yeah, I know. Remoraid, this strange little fish Pokemon, becomes an octopus. I don't know why. And for the longest time, nobody knows why. I think they were trying to go for like a Magikarp Gyarados surprise evolution, like turning something normal and boring into something epic, but Octillery doesn't quite meet that standard as Gyarados. It grabs prey with its tentacles and headbutts them. If prey is too tough, it sprays them with ink and escapes. It sneaks into rocky holes to rest and sleep. It can even steal holes from other Pokemon. The ink that Octillery sprays at its opponents can dull their sense of smell, so even keen nose beings can get lost. Its ink is used in cooking. For some weird reason. For the longest time, people doubted it even evolved from Remoraid because they're so different. I mean, how? That's the equivalent of a barnacle becoming a whale. How? Well, that's a story for another day. And maybe we might not ever get an answer. But until then, let's go on to... Number 8. Don Fan. I love elephants. And for the longest time, Don Fan was the only elephant Pokemon. So naturally, 
it had to be one of my favorites from Gen 2. Due to its small size, Donphan is likely based on pygmy elephants. Its name comes from Don, the Spanish word for master, and elephant. Its thick armor on its head and back is just like that of a thick tire or wheel. Donphan made his anime debut in the first Pokemon movie, where Ash battles that one trainer during the opening credits. How surprised were you when you first saw this, 90s kids? I bet it was mind-blowing. Donphan is so tough that it can knock down a whole house. The bigger its tusks are, the higher its ranking in its own herd. Its skin is so tough that it can't even be scratched. Cars can't even knock it over. It curls up into a ball and rolls at high speeds when angry. It's very difficult to stop. It clears rocks and mudslides on mountain trails. It's strong enough to haul a whole dump truck. If there's one thing that Donphan can't do, is that it can't stand the rain. Being a ground type, it's of course weak to it. So if it was caught out in the rain, it would get pretty weak and damp. I love Donphan and its ground typing. But the reason it's still so low on this list is because since then, there have been many other elephant Pokemon that have become a lot stronger than Donphan. But they're topics for another day. We're talking about Gen 2 here. Regardless, until then, Donphan was one tough cookie. Number 7. Ampharos. Just look at this guy. To think this tall, yellow, thing evolves from a little blue sheep. As its evolution line suggests, Ampharos is based on sheared sheep. As a Mareep, it's covered in wool, but when Mareep evolves into Flaffy, as we can see, half of its wool is sheared off due to the amount of electricity it's generating. And by the time Flaffy evolves into Ampharos, the wool is completely gone. Its name comes from Amp and Pharos, the Greek word for lighthouse. Is it just me, or is Ampharos also based on, do androids dream of electric sheep? I'll see myself out. I love this thing's design. The yellow and black stripes, it's soft, slender, and pointy all in the right places. Its tail light can be seen from far away, and it acts like a beacon. Ampharos can be seen from space. What? Are you meaning to tell me that this Pokemon, with a light the size of a baseball, you can see that glowing from space? Cool. This Pokemon was used to send signals with its tail long ago. Heck, Ampharos was one of the lucky Pokemon from Generation 2 to gain a Mega Evolution. In this form, its wool grows back in again due to the excess energy it's producing. It even gains a Dragon Typing which according to its Pokedex entries, stems from its long sleeping dragon's blood. Wait, a sheep that's part dragon, mega evolves, and becomes dragon type? Awesome! Good for you, Ampharos. Number 6. Meganium. Now, I know what all of you are thinking. Really? You chose that over the other starters? And yes, that is correct. I like Meganium more than the other two. The thing is, the Gen 2 starters don't really offer up a lot. The Gen 2 starters are a little less interesting than the Gen 1 starters. I mean, comparing their first forms to their final forms, they don't really add a lot to them. I mean, they all just get a little bigger. Typhlosion doesn't really look all that different from Cyndaquil, Feraligator just looks weird. To me, Meganium just looks the nicest out of all of them. There's just something about its head emerging from a giant flower that really appeals to me. Its name comes from Mega and Geranium. I was a big fan of dinosaurs when I was a young kid, so seeing this grass-type dinosaur was just perfect. It's based on long-necked dinosaurs like sauropods, and geranium flowers. Another reason that the Gen 2 starters aren't as good as the first ones is that none of them gain a secondary typing. Each one remains pure grass, pure fire, and pure water. Yeah, sure, Blastoise didn't have a secondary typing, but at least that looked cool. 
So as a result, because of their pure typing, they're restricted with how many different moves they can learn. Chances are they're likely only going to be able to learn fire, grass, water type moves, and that's it. So unfortunately, Meganium, compared to the other starters, you're not as great as the others. But not to worry, Meganium. I still think you look nice, and you'll always have a special place in my heart. The flower around Meganium's neck calms people's emotions. It can even revive dead plants by breathing on them. Hey, that sounds familiar. Number 5. Teddy Ursa. Aww, just look at this guy, he's a teddy bear. In case it wasn't obvious enough, the name comes from teddy bear and Ursa, the Latin word for bear. The reason I like Teddy Ursa, I mean, isn't it obvious? It's cute. It's downright adorable, even. It's likely based off the Asian black bear, also known as the Ring of the Moon bear, as well as the constellations Ursa Minor and Major. Another reason why Teddy Ursa is on this list is because of its ability, Pick Up. Normally, if you just wander around for a bit, and every once in a while, look upon the Teddy Ursa in your party, you'll see that it's picked up a random item. Now, what happens when you get that Teddy Ursa up to level 90 and above? It will gain the ability to pick up leftovers. In my opinion, leftovers is the greatest item you can give your Pokemon in any generation. The item leftovers allows a Pokemon to gradually heal up some of their HP after every single turn of a battle. In a battle where you're constantly losing health, every little bit of HP counts and having Teddy Ursa with this ability at that high of a level increases that chances of finding leftovers by quite a lot. Its crescent markings light up when it finds honey. It's like a honey-detecting Care Bear. It always licks its paws due to being constantly soaked in honey. It hoards food before winter. It even steals from combi nests. It absorbs honey by making its own by blending fruits and pollen. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If Teddy Ursa can create its own honey, why does it bother looking for its own by raiding nests? Ugh, I don't understand it. Maybe that depiction of Teddy Ursa in the anime was accurate all along. Each one of Teddy Ursa's paws tastes unique. Wait, it tastes unique? Who on earth discovered that fact? Who's going around licking Teddy Ursa paws? Ew. Number four. Hitmontop. Hitmontop is probably the most unique out of all the Hitmon line. Hitmon Lee and Hitmon Chan have been pretty famous in Gen 1. They're the few Pokemon that are actually based on real people. Hitmon Lee is based off Bruce Lee and Hitmonchan is based off Jackie Chan. Both of them are well-known experts in martial arts. And ever since Tyrogue got introduced, not only has it connected both of these two Pokemon together in the same family, but it also gives us a new third option, Hitmontop. Although Hitmontop isn't based on a real person, it's still pretty unique with its fighting style. Its idle dancing animation is based off Ginga, a fighting style based in Koporia. It's an Afro-Brazilian martial arts involving spinning your legs. I just love the way this thing looks. It's pretty silly looking, but it's a good type of silly. You end up getting drilled if you become enchanted by its kicks. Whatever that means. Is it because of the spike on its head, or are we talking about a different type of drilling altogether here? It launches kicks while spinning, and it could drill straight down into the ground. It does handstands to throw off its opponents. It spins on its head like a spinning top to travel faster than walking. Its horn is made of chitin, the same material used to make rhino horns, mammal claws, and fur, which grows all throughout its life. Can we have that dance on again one more time? Thank you! Number 3 Crobat. 
Out of all the new evolutions introduced in this generation, Crobat is one of the strongest. Its name comes from Cross and Bat. Now a lot of people don't like the Zubat line, and I can understand why. When it comes to nighttime and dark places like caves, they're likely going to be the only thing you'll find, making them pretty annoying encounters. But with Crobat, you might regret that statement. Golbat was already pretty tough, considering it was technically a final evolution, but with this new addition to the Zubat line, Crobat has become even tougher. Its typing and stats are really good. It's primarily immune to ground types. It's based on vampire bats. Now, either this is its wingspan or its height, but Crobat is supposedly 5'11". That's taller than me! But aside from that, with its high stats and incredible typing, Crobat is one of the toughest fighters. So much so that I've used one multiple times across my teams. Its four wings allow silent flight. These four wings make it hard for Crobat to stop and rest. It can use one set of wings if it's tired, flying on just two. It flies faster with its four wings, but it also makes it really clumsy when walking. Because of this high metabolism brought on by its four wings, it has to constantly drink blood in order to keep fit and to keep flying. It drains all the blood from its prey by the neck in a single heartbeat. Yikes. So sharp you won't feel a thing. Ow! Number 2. Giraffe Rig. Ooh, what a shock. The giraffe Pokemon isn't at my number one spot. Well, there's a pretty interesting reason for that. Giraffe Rig is kind of a late favorite of mine. Giraffe Rig's always kind of been on my radar, even before I had my whole giraffe lover, fresh powder phase. But I still appreciate Giraffe Rig because, just like Dawn Fan, for the longest time, it's been the only giraffe Pokemon. Its name is Giraffe, but as a palindrome. What's a palindrome, you ask? Well, spell Giraffe Rig backwards. It's the exact same thing. Mind blown. Originally, Giraffe Rig was going to be a double-sided giraffe, with two front halves directly connected to each other at the navel, similar to Cat Dog. But for whatever reason, the back half has been reduced to just its tail. At least until Gen 9, where the tail would become a lot more prominent. But that's an entry for another day. Even though Giraffe Rig is the giraffe Pokemon, it's a very small one. It's only about 4 feet 11 inches tall. Most baby giraffes are even taller than that when they're born. They're about 6 feet tall. Its tail has a small brain of its own, which will bite if you get too close or if it smells you. The tail has special powers, which drives enemies away. Honestly, if I saw that, I'd run away as well. The tail doesn't even sleep when Giraffe Rig sleeps, so it keeps watch 24 hours a day. The tail mouths eating when the main head eats. Giraffe Rig can even fight backwards on occasion. Despite its late entry, I used one member of the Giraffe Rig line the most out of any other Pokemon across any other generation. Seriously, I've used a Giraffe Rig on two separate teams and a Farigaraf on another. If my Fresh Powder Giraffe Lover phase started a little earlier, I think Giraffe Rig would have secured its place as number one. But you'll just have to wait for my number one in just a moment. Now before we get to number one, I'd like to have an honorable mention. Piloswine. The only honorable mention I'll bring up today. Piloswine became a favorite of mine due to my early dinosaur phase. But the reason I didn't put it on the list is because it evolves into something even better in the form of Mamoswine. But despite this, it doesn't really look much like a mammoth, so I decided, eh, probably not worthy of this list. Sorry, Piloswine. Just be glad you get an evolution in Gen 4. And now, my number one favorite Gen 2 Pokemon is... Politoed. You might have heard me using the phrase, delightfully goofy, to describe a lot of Pokemon on these lists. Well, this guy. 
This guy is the definition of delightfully goofy. Its name comes from Pollywog and Toad. Obviously based on frogs, Polytoad is admired as a king by its pre-evolutions due to it holding a king's rock in order to evolve. Polytoad just feels more like an evolution than Polyrath ever did. For example, you've got Poliwhirl. All you need to do is give it a water stone in order to evolve it into a Polyrath. Uh, in order to evolve it into a Polyrath. Editors, you meant to show me the evolution of Poliwhirl into Polyrath. What? It already evolved? Since when? That's not an evolution! It just gets bigger! What changes about it? It gains a fighting type? Yeah, enough about that. Where's the change? Seriously? It just gets a little bigger. That's not an evolution. Polytoad, on the other hand, actually feels like it fits the Poliwag evolution to a T. Think about it. Poliwag is the tadpole Pokemon. It starts off with no arms and just a tail and a pair of legs. When it evolves into Poliwhirl, it grows arms, just like real world tadpoles. And by the time Poliwhirl becomes an adult, in this case, Politoed, it looks more like a frog. You see what I mean? Now this has led to a bit of a debate whether or not Poliwrath or Politoed is better. Honestly, it's up to opinions. In order to illustrate its Pokedex entries, feel free to absorb this artwork which I made quite a few years ago. Poliwag and Poliwhirl gather en masse when it sings. It expands its throat to croak in tune with others on moonlit nights. Its curled hair proves its status as a king. Its screams inspired a composer to write a ballad. Wait, what? A frog inspired a famous piece of music? I wonder what that would have sounded like. Alright, never mind, forget it, let's just go to the outro now, now, now! Well folks, there you have it. My top 10 Gen 2 Pokemon. Join me next time where I dive into Generation 3, a lot of people's favorites from childhood, with a lot of new Pokemon for us to dive into. So until next time, stay fresh, and thank you for watching.